Before we get going into your Hockey IQ podcast episode, I want to thank our sponsor, Rapid Shot. Rapid Shot is the smart shooting lane. Uh, it's like a batting cage for hockey players. Very cool. Tracks your shot in three ways. Accuracy, shot speed, and reaction time. Uh, easy to use. Uh, actually, I used it when I played and was growing up. Very easy. Simply scan your phone in, select your settings, and start shooting. Uh, you can see your stats on the app and online. And you can check them out at rapidshot.com. Uh, great small business. I actually grew up with one of the owner's sons and have played with all the family members by now. Uh, just in local pickups here in Ohio. Very cool local business. Awesome product. I love it. I know quite a few NHLers have them in their homes. Uh, a lot of D1 programs have it at their rinks. So you have to check this out. Rapidshot.com. Check it out. Rapidshot, thank you so much for sponsoring our podcast. On the Hockey IQ podcast today, we bring on Derek Newmeyer. Uh, Derek, welcome. Uh, excited to talk some hockey. We've got a player that you and I absolutely love and adore, so we'll get to that. Um, but I, I want to make sure that we don't scare too many people off. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about a lot about players uh, that are prospects um, and may or may not be on NHL rosters or barely on it. But we're really going to dive into the skills here. So really excited to have you on. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about what makes players special. So regardless of the name, uh, you know, people can look out for these guys, but also dig into what makes them special and why they're so good and take that back to your own game or just the enjoyment of the little details of the game. So first guy you and I automatically connected on was Jonathan or Jonathan, however you pronounce it in Swedish, uh, Bergren, uh, in Detroit, like kids nasty. And yeah. definitely over overlooked um, by the NHL based on just like, huh, he's 5'11", 197 pounds. And he's definitely not 5'11", 197 pounds. No way. No, no, not even close. It's it's funny. You know, every scout, um, and for those who don't know, I, I'm the assistant director of scouting with McKean's Hockey. Uh, I was with FC Hockey before this season, before making the switch. And I've been doing this for a few years now. And uh, Berggren is a guy I've really liked uh, going back to his draft year. And every scout, you know, just has these certain guys that they find that they just like way more than consensus. And Berggren was one of those guys for me. Uh, when I published my draft list uh, at Defending Big D, uh, which covers the Dallas Stars primarily for the 2018 draft, I had Berggren at 15 which was really, really sticking my neck out there for him. Um, I think everywhere else had him, you know, as high as like 30 at the highest, maybe in the 40s or 50s. But I just saw something that I really, really liked. And I think he really is a special player. I think he brings something different to the table that you don't often always see. You know, if for a guy who is, you know, probably not 5'11", probably closer to 5'9 or 5'10", maybe 180 pounds soaking wet, Usually for players like that, you need to be a really, really high end skater, like really fast or, you know, just exceptionally strong or just exceptionally skilled to make it. And I can see why some teams were a little hesitant about him in, in his draft year, but this was a guy who's always been really high end. I mean, his scoring totals from that season of 2018 in the Swedish uh, top under 20 league were phenomenal. Like one of the highest point per game percentages uh, of anyone in that league, you know, even higher than guys like Nicholas Backstrom. Um, you know, the, the point totals were there at the U18 tournament. He looked good um, at the Five Nations tournament that year. He looked good. But what I always loved about Berggren is, is more than anything else is the motor and the pace that he plays at. You know, he's not necessarily the fastest guy, maybe not the cleanest with his footwork, but he just has so much energy that he plays with and so much pace. Like when you really watch him when he's on his game, his feet just never stop moving. You know, he's, he's got this energy that just flows from shift to shift. And he's really that kind of guy who can drive play for his line or for his whole team. You know, it was funny watching him in his draft year because he was just relentless. Like he would attack constantly. He would challenge guys one-on-one -on -one constantly. But he also wasn't a selfish player. Like he would beat a guy to the outside and then be immediately looking for the pass. You know, he could take it to the net if he wanted to, but he was really smart about how he used his teammates as well. 
But yeah, it was just when you watch, if you ever go back and watch highlights of him from that year, he was just never, he just never stopped moving. His feet were always churning and in a way that was very deceptive, you know, for a guy who might not have the best skating overall, he's really strong in his lower body, really good edge work. You know, his ability to shift his weight was really impressive. So he had a lot of deception as to how he moved. And it was fun just watching him against competition at that level because he would just come at you and defenders almost got scared a little bit when he would challenge them one-on-one because he was just so intimidating with, you know, the energy and the intensity with which he attacked. Yeah. I, I think the the big thing with him um, is you'd never say like, he's a high level skater, like just kind of like Johnny Goudreau, like doesn't kind of look the part of like a high end skater, but you look at him, he's always got movement and that's mm-hmm. always hard to defend. And, and I teach players all the time on one-on-ones. I'm like, you have to threaten something. If you're not threatening anything, they're just going to attack you and take you out of the play and push you into spots. Mm -hmm. So like that movement component that he has, like you just referenced is like one of his best attributes is may not be the most amazing skater may look a little sloppy, but he's always moving and he's always challenging something that they have to respect. And if they don't, Mm -hmm. he's got that little like deceptive speed kind of goes like 70%. And then you like attack, but he's got like that extra little step and he just like walks by you and you're like, what the heck just happened here? Um, And I, and I love guys that can like play it. I I just call quote it like the 75% guys, like it's still fast. It's still pushing. It's still threatening, but there's a little bit extra in there that he's not showing you quite yet. And then he just dives around people. Uh, I forget who he played this year, but he did it to someone, some defenseman and they're like, and it was someone like Drew Doughty or it might've been like Cam Fowler, something like that, where like really good defenseman seen a million mm-hmm. times and Berger and just like, da, 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 did it like the, between the feet, like kick off the skate and walk around you along the boards. Like it was unbelievable. And I, and I love that high motor where he's always threatening, always yeah. challenging you. And I think his game is actually better in the small areas and the smaller rink rather than the big Olympic sheet that you see over in Europe. Yeah, it was, it was really funny, too. Um, I didn't even mention his puck skill yet, because that's really a big key to his success as an attacker. Like, he'll challenge you with his feet, but he'll also challenge you with his hands, and he can switch it up back and forth, which makes him really hard to predict. This, you know, it's one of the ways he's been so effective as, as a one-on-one player. But it's also been really interesting to watch him adapt to the NHL this year because in Sweden, on the open ice surface, like you were talking about, you know, there's a lot more times where he would just kind of like carry the puck for longer, you know, really take his time with it, circle the offensive zone, and it worked really well for him there. But what I've loved about watching him so far this season in Detroit is he's really adapted his game well, like you were saying, to the small area. You know, sometimes you only get that split second or that tiniest bit of space, right? Where you get a loose puck and you need to make something happen with it. You know, you got to get it through a guy's feet or under someone's stick, or just, you know, have that quick burst through a bit of space to either open up yourself for a pass or to, you know, get to loose puck first. And it's been really fascinating how well he's adapted his game to do that and be successful. You know, you don't see him just wheeling with the puck like you did in Sweden, but he's still putting up a lot of points and driving pretty good possession for the Red Wings by adapting his game a lot. And I think that maybe in, you know, four or five years, once he's uh, adjusted to the NHL a little bit more, we might see some of the really flashier stuff that he was doing before. And then he's going to be a very, (laughs) a very dangerous player. Well, it's not like he's making flashy, like he's, you would never say he's a flashy player per se. He can make some plays where you're like, OMG, but it's never like, oh, he's going to do the Michigan and, you know, he's going to look like Trevor Zegers out here, just like a puck wizard. Like he has the abilities to do all of that, but he prefers being really good um, at the simple skills, for example, of like just pulling a puck off his left foot all the way to his right foot. Like that's extremely fast and quick where you can't really touch it. Like, I feel like that's where his puck handling is really strong. And and for me, the, the, the puck handling specifically that I love about him is he's comfortable and, and he's great at it, but he actually underhandles the puck. Like I, I find yeah. like Elias Pettersson is fit, like a, the poster child for this. Like guy can dangle you any day of the week. Like it's unbelievable, but you see him and he's just like really quick from one foot to the other foot. He's tapping the puck constantly so he's really hard to take off if you're going to try to like physically impose yourself on him because he's not actually touching the puck he just lets you 
push them. He absorbs it and he keeps going, or he's able to tap it through guys and over across the net as you're going through traffic. Like th- these are high level like details that only the elite players seem to be extremely adept at. Most guys like to try to keep the puck on their stick the whole time. And anytime they take contact, it just flies off. And now mm-hmm. they got to just have their face in a wall and just keep pushing play. Like Bergeron's consistently like pushing into space and allowing things to open up for him or put it in guys triangles where it's really, really hard for them uh, to defend or at least get a clean knock of the puck where they feel like they're in control. You never feel you're in control if you ever watch him play. Yeah, he's really good at playing through the triangle. There were times um, when he was playing in Sweden, both at the under-20 level and at the SHL, where you know if you gave him a little bit of space, he would try and do a little bit more. And some of his highlights from those leagues are pretty good. But it's, just, it's really not his game. That's not his bread and butter. Like He can do that. And if you give him a little bit of time and space and, you know, maybe it's the game's kind of out of the reach and he just wants to try something like he'll do it, but that's not where he's going to really make his money in the NHL. It's going to be the smart, like lower, lower risk plays, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because he's really good at that. Like he doesn't need to be the type of guy who can do something flashy because he's just so efficient, you know, with his puck touches, he's just really, really efficient in what he generates with them. And and I think one thing to add that I know we're going to get to, and I'll I'll just set you up here. Like his backhand is stupid. Good. Like he clearly has worked on this a ton in his life where it is extremely strong and he'll just snap a backhand pass. And you're like, that's better than 95% of the NHL on their forehand. Yeah. It was funny. We were talking a little bit about, about him before we started recording here and we talked about his low center of gravity and how strong he is in in his lower body for a smaller guy. And, you know, you you get a little bit of like Crosby-esque flashes from that, especially when he's got the backhand going, right? The way he's able to kind of shake off defenders, widen his stance a little bit, just to, you know, keep himself balanced and, you know, not get knocked over, not get pushed out of position and then get in tight and then finish with that backhand. It's, It's pretty special the way he's able to put those elements of his game together. And, you know, he's, he's pretty good as a wrist shot, too. He's deceptive as a playmaker. You know, he's very comfortable and pretty accurate with his behind-the-back passes. So once he gets just into that dangerous ice, you know, he can beat you in a lot of different ways. But, yeah, the backhand, that's it's, it's pretty special what he's got going there. Yeah, I love how you were talking about getting into dangerous ice because that's where I think – he really jumps off the page for me and where I really noticed him, like all these little things add to his game and are great, but the areas that he finds himself on the ice, like he is fantastic at getting into the high, high, high ice, like where he's touching the blue line with the skates in between the defenseman and he curls down. Like he scored a great goal. Uh, Someone's at the right point doing some stick handling. Usually you'd see someone like chuck a point shot from there. And Berger, and it's just like in his face, like as soon as the guy looked up and after he did a little shake, like, oh, I have a guy right next to me. He just makes like an easy 10 foot pass. The defense was not going to go that far out and guard mm-hmm. him all the way up at the blue line. Just takes like three steps in, rips a shot, uh, a lot of traffic. Like you're not going to say he's going to beat anyone with pace, like for sure. Not, not his type of shot, but nice and accurate working downhill. Like he can score. Like, I, I love that. Mm-hmm. That's number one. And then the second place that he finds himself constantly he's always working off the net like working off the back post sliding Mm -hmm. into either behind the net for like a rim release or he'll grab a puck there and kind of work Gretzky's office uh, and the defense doesn't know where to get him and then if no pucks are there to be had like he'll just step like a step away from the net and just wait for rebounds and I think he's already got like three or four already and Mm -hmm. he he came up like a quarter of the way through the season and, and already in that like he's gotten well now I'll put in quotations here air quotes lucky but I think he just puts himself in a great spot on the back post and just works like those two spots unbelievably well so go go into the hard areas even though he's not big yeah and it, it ties into what we were talking about earlier with his pace and his motor right because he just he doesn't take himself out of the play or if you try to take himself out of the play he's just going to roll off a defender and try and find something else to generate right to try and find some other way to get in there you know, when you're always staying in motion, when you're always accurately reading where the defenders are going, you know, sometimes you can get boxed out or covered. But if you keep working at it, if, you, if you're constantly just pressing, 
and, you know, trying to poke the defense and trying to find a spot, you're eventually going to find your spots. And, you know, sometimes if it is just getting to the net for a tap and a rebound, a lot of guys don't get there. You know, if you're not able to just, you know, bowl your way there, if you're six foot four, 220 pounds, if you're his size, you, know, you got to really be consistent with your prodding and picking the spots. You know, there really is a talent to just getting yourself to those spots for those tap-ins, especially when you're that size and you're not, you know, elite skater or don't have a ton of size and strength and reach to work with. But I think that really goes to show just how smart Berggren is. Like when he was younger, he took some criticism for playing a little bit too much on the perimeter. And it's something he talked about in interviews. And you can just see from, you know, three or four years ago to where he is now, his game has improved so much. Like he's really adjusted a lot to get into those better areas. And I think it bodes really well for his long-term upside because he's a guy who's proven that he can learn and adapt to different levels and different challenges. And I expect him to keep doing that. Adaptability. I think it's uh, underrated. Like, has a guy just figured out or found a way to make themselves effective, no matter what the role is, um, and just earned it. And and I think he's one of those guys. And you mentioned like perimeter player. Usually, like that would be the most common criticism, probably from his draft years. Like he's always on the mm-hmm. perimeter. But if you kind of go back to the video, you're like, well, yeah, he may have been on the perimeter, but figure out where those pucks usually ended up, which was in the middle, danger areas, back of the net, those types of things. And he's just adjusted now to make himself more of a scoring threat. So he's not just going to be a guy who scores five goals and has 35 assists. He's going to be a guy who probably has 15, 20 goals and another 30, 40 assists in there where it's going to be a nice balanced attack or maybe just some seasons where, you know, he just piles up 30 just from banging in goals and areas that are really tough on the defense. So it's a great way to find it. and you kind of alluded to it's like he has the timing for it it's not like he's just sitting there because you can't do that unless you're massive and even then it's hard to get a stick free and all that Mm -hmm. and it's funny too talking about his perimeter play i mean he's really good on the perimeter you know as as a junior playing in sweden he was well over a point per game you know just one of the best players in his in his league at mostly playing from the perimeter and, you know, maybe once he's a little bit older and he's earned more power play time, we're going to see more of that in Detroit because that's another part of his game that's really strong as well. So, you know, he, he, he's not going to just stay there once he can. He's, I think the, his tendencies now to get inside are going to stay consistent, but he's going to be a guy who can beat you from both the inside and the outside, and that's going to make him pretty special. Yeah, I love that he's got an A game and a B game. So no matter what, he's going to be able to be effective. Uh, it's not like some of these guys don't have one way we can do it. Um, you know, I love to bash my, my buddy, Sean Corrali. Like, you know, you know how he's going to play and it's kind of what he's got and it's effective because it's positionally sound and foundationally sound, but there's no way he's going to make that jump to really uh, add a ton of points and or offense to his game. So absolutely love that. Mm-hmm. Moving on a little bit here, uh, I think I think we can move on to uh, two players. Uh, we're going to talk about Crystal, and then we also want to talk – and I may be butchering his name. You know him way better than I do, but also I want to talk about uh, the amazing talent that is Connor Bedard and, like, what is it that actually truly makes him special? Like, at five foot nine to be, like, one of those generational-type talents, uh, you, you got to be doing something right and something at a very elite level. Uh, and I'll, I'll let you kick kick it off here. Of like, what are the actual elements that separate him and make him truly, truly talented? Connor Bedard, first of all. I mean, it's uh, I'm not saying anything that people don't already know, but it's it's the shot. You know, his ability to shoot it off either foot, just the ex- ridiculous amount of power that he gets out of it. His ability to shoot from awful angles like it's almost like the stick is just an extension of his body you know he, he makes it look so incredibly natural the way he's able to do it you know just and he can elevate from no space at all even from the tightest of positions it's just he makes it all look so easy and it's it's funny like even when you watch him I don't even fully understand it sometimes like I've watched a lot of good shooters come through the WHL and, you know, my crossover scouting with other leagues. And there's still just elements to Bedard that I don't fully understand when I try to watch him. It's like, how did he do that? Like I'm, I watched the goal and I rewind the tape. I'm like, how, like, how did he manage to pull that shot off? 
Um, it's been really cool to watch him this season too, because he's gotten a lot better at creating space to use his shot. You know, he wasn't bad at it before, but he's really um, worked a lot on his lateral skating. He's gotten a little bit quicker in a straight line. He can beat people wide a little bit, open up a little bit more space, but really the, that bread and butter is, you know, using the hands and the feet in conjunction to, you know, just open up a little bit of space side to side. You know, if you get too close to him, you know, he can just easily just pull the puck around you. And even at the weirdest, hardest angle, regardless of what foot he's trying to shoot off of, he can just bury it wherever he wants, top corner, five hole, it doesn't matter. And it's it's pretty wild to, to see him see him do it. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen a player who's better at scoring through a defender's legs than Bedard ever. You know, it's almost like, I, I don't know how he does it. It's, it's just really crazy how good he is at shooting through the triangle. And, you know, his puck protection is really good. Like, it's really hard to strip him of the puck when he gets it in a good spot. And his ability to score from distance, like for a guy that size, it's kind of remarkable. There's just so many different things about his game that are just so truly special to watch. Yeah, the thing for me with Bedard is how he does it heads up hockey. Like, no oh, yeah. one else can. Like, he is reading cues in the environment like no one else can. Like, a lot of – like, I, I've seen guys who have, like, shots similar to that. Um, I mean, obviously, his is probably insane and better than all of theirs, but, like, relatively similar. But they need the conditions to be extremely favorable and exacting to how they can make it work. Like you mm-hmm. mentioned, he can shoot it off both feet. Like the fact that he's able to do it off of both feet, unbelievable. Something that's separator, but he's reading the environment like, okay, which foot do I need to do? How can I work it? That really allows him to like read the game and dictate the game in real time that no one else really can do. Like everyone else needs this and this is how I do it. And it comes back for me, like, how do you actually evaluate skill? Like there's the technical aspect but then there's also the application of the technique. And that's where I'm like, okay, that's actual skill and talent. That's absolutely amazing. And where he really separates himself and guys like Mitch Marner do it all the time where you're like, huh, he's like reading a game in real time. And that defenseman, like I go and play hockey and I'm like, all right, this is like good enough. I'll try this. And it's like, I believe he has three options in his head at all times. And just whatever the defenseman does, uh, he's got a solution for it. Like it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's funny to talk about it like that because, like you said, you know, there's a lot of guys who might have great shooting mechanics, great power, great accuracy, but they need those perfect conditions to be dangerous. You need, you know, five feet of space, five feet of space, just the right amount of distance to the goalie. And sure, in those in that perfect scenario, they're going to score all the time. But that's not how it works in the NHL. You know, every now and again, you might get lucky. You know, maybe you have Mitch Marner who can create some space to feed you the puck and you get a shot like that every now and again, but that's not really how it works. But that's what makes Bedard so special. You know, he doesn't need anything. He just needs the tiniest little bit of window. You know, he can, he can score from standing completely still in a way that I've never seen another player do it, but he can also just fire screaming wrist shots off the rush. You know, his one-timer is incredible. But yeah, it's, it's his ability to shoot from in tight and in traffic. You know, you think you might have, you know, your stick on the puck. You know, you might think you've closed the gap enough as a defender or you pushed into the outside. You can just make the subtlest, fastest move with the stick. And suddenly it's going, the puck's going under your stick and past you and somehow top corner behind the goalie. You know, his ability to score from anywhere in the offensive zone with the smallest amount of time and the least amount or the littlest amount of space, it's really what separates him. And at first, when I was watching Bedard, I'm like, okay, like, obviously the shot is incredible, but he's small, you know, maybe not the best skater, like great, like really good skater, but not, you know, I wouldn't say an elite skater. So watching him come up through the WHL, which I've been fortunate to do, um, I was kind of wondering, like, how is he going to adapt? Like, how is this going to work to the NHL level? Because you see a lot of young phenoms that don't 
quite make it the way that some phenoms like a McDavid or a Crosby do. But I have no reservations at all about Bedard being successful in the NHL. You know, he's going to have some challenges and have to adapt his game a little bit. But just his ability to score with just the smallest openings in the, the, the just the right times, that's going to translate really, really well. Because you have to know like how to finish with what is there. And Bedard certainly has that, especially playing on Regina over the last few years where he's been an, on an awful team. He's had to do kind of everything by himself. You know, he's always the guy the other teams are trying to shut down. And there have been a lot of times where the defenders have done a good job at taking his face away, you know, playing him hard, playing him tight. And he's already figured out how to score doing that despite, you know, all that attention and defensive focus. And I have a feeling that's going to translate to the NHL as well, just because he's, he understands so well how to create those little bits of extra space and just how to finish with what he's given. Yeah. And there, you, you mentioned, it's like how he reads space um, and he's constantly heads up hockey, whether he's on the puck yeah. or off the puck, like he scans unbelievably well. Like yeah. I want to, I would love to see someone just take a camera, uh, go to Regina or wherever they're at, just record a game, just looking at him and just looking at how often he is scanning the ice. Uh, Cause I have a feeling compared to the league average and maybe all time, in the WHL or CHL, it's going to be one of the best, if not the best of all time. Uh, like it seems that there's no situation where he doesn't have an idea of like generally where it needs to go or how he needs to play the situation. Um, Mm -hmm. It just screams off the page, how well he scans and builds a mental map of the ice uh, and the ability to make quick decisions from that. Like you can see, uh, the intensity and the game awareness is just off the charts. That I, I, the scanning on the puck's great and reading the cues is awesome, but also just the idea of like, eh, here's where the next play needs to get made. Sometimes you just need to go to the next play. Like he is a highlight reel. We can all see it. But if you watch an actual game, there's constantly these little decisions where you're like, ah, he's got the good decision bug. Some players got the mm-hmm. bad decision bug. He's got a good decision bug. And it all starts with how often he looks and scans and, checks your shoulder so uh if you're listening and you have a camera and ability to go to a a barn that he's playing in uh reach out let's talk about it this would be a really cool project yeah it's funny he's he's never looking down you know he's always got his head up and it's pretty cool how well he's able to control the puck and fire it you know just heads up the whole way you know he'll come on he'll come down the wing on on a defender one-on-one and you'll just see him he's got like just uh, laser focus on that defender, you know, completely psyching him out and then just rip that shot, you know, even from top of the circles and it'll just be the goalie clean top corner without even looking, you know, like he, the, the defender doesn't even know what to do. Right. Cause you think he's going to give you some kind of signal as to what he's going to try, whether it's going to be shooting from there or try and, you know, get a little bit closer, try and beat you with his, with his hands. And it's just, you don't know. Cause he's so, deceptive about it he just hides it so well because he's not he's not telegraphing what he's going to do with his vision or or his body language i i love that like not telegraphing um because how many players like they kind of need to lean to the next move ever so slightly so they can pull it Mm -hmm. off clean uh he doesn't have to do that and it obviously no. comes back to a lot of work off the ice to do it. But I think that's an absolutely critical point that you just made there of like, you can't really tell what he's going to do until it's too late and you're screwed. And it's a gold medal around his neck for team Canada. Like it looks like yeah. he was about to shoot twice and then boom around you, boom around you, backhand finish into an empty cage. One, one thing he's really started to do more this season that I've noticed that I love every time I see it. And I, I think he's trying to incorporate it into this game a little bit more. It's the toe drag, no look pass. Cause everyone knows that toe drag is incredible. It's, it's deadly. You know, he's, he's going to toe drag it just to get that, get around you a little bit and fire it. But he's got this ability now to do the no look toe drag pass. And he pulled it off a couple of times at the world juniors that I thought was pretty exciting to watch. And I've gone back and watched a little bit of the stuff from Regina and I've seen it more. And it's funny to see him, like, even as good as he is, he's still trying new things because everyone knows now kind of what to expect out of him. But he's still so good that he's adapting new parts of his game that they haven't seen yet. 
And that's kind of why you can't contain him that well. You know, his scoring pace is incredible this season. He's definitely going to finish with a goal per game in the WHL. You know, it, it was hard to see how he could have outpaced himself from last year, but it's probably going to happen. Yeah, incredible. I mean, the, the elite elite, they're always evolving, adding new pieces and elements, uh, and he's no different. So it, it's not hard to imagine he's going to be uh, Crosby McDavid level. Uh, I still have some doubts that he'll reach that high of highs, uh, but I would never stick my neck out saying that it couldn't happen. Uh, he's going to be elite in some capacity, just a matter of what level of eliteness does he does he find. Uh yeah, spot yeah. on. Um, moving on here. So there, there's a guy, um, Crystal, I believe he plays Oshawa? Kelowna. Oh, man, I'm, I'm not even close. All right, you got to fill me in on this guy. What makes him special? I, I don't know him, but you're the 2023 draft expert here. Yeah, well, we were talking about Berggren when we were deciding to record this podcast, and we're talking about other things we could talk about. And I'm like, well, I kind of want to talk about Andrew Crystal, because it kind of comes into your wheelhouse a little bit about, you know, hockey IQ and what makes players special and, you know, teaching and development and stuff like that. And Crystal reminds me in some ways of Berggren, different in some ways as well, but similar profiles, uh, similar strengths. And I think he's going to be one of the more interesting case studies uh, to come out of this draft class because he's just very unique in how he plays and what he brings. So he's, he's definitely on the smaller side, about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, uh, maybe around 170, 180 pounds. But uh, I don't know how much of that is pure muscle. You know, he, I think there are things that he can improve with the strength and his conditioning. And his skating's not the greatest. You know, he's quick in tight spaces and in short bursts, and he's got some his, – his footwork's okay, his agility's okay, but it's not a super strong attribute for him. But he's a guy that's just doing incredible things this year in the WHL, you know, almost two points per game on average, playing on a team with almost no help. You know, he's a 17-year-old as one of the top scorers in the league – uh, on a consistent basis from the start of the season all the way through. And he's doing it with almost no help. And watching him is really interesting because he just, there are not a lot of players like him, especially at the NHL level. So there's been a lot of discussion as to how well he's going to translate. And you're seeing some of that play out in the scouting community because some places have him high, ranked as high as maybe five or six on draft boards, but other places have them a lot lower. Um, NHL Central Scouting had him, I think it was 16th among just North American skaters. So that puts him closer to 20 to 25. So, you know, a big shift from, you know, possibly going as high as five or six. So it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with him. Um, there's in terms of what he brings, he's similar to Berggren in the sense that, you know, just great, great um, play reading, um, great ability with the puck on his stick. He's just a really pure playmaker. Uh, I, I love his gravity, you know, his ability to draw defenders into him before opening up another uh, passing lane or a shooting lane or just some other kind of way to, you know, keep the play alive. It's really, really high end. Um, it's funny to watch him just because you think you've got him, like you, the defender will close the gap on him and think, you know, that the play is going to die. It's going to get snuffed out into the boards or into the corner. And he's just always finds a way to keep it alive somehow. You know, he's, he's good with his puck skills. He's not, you know, like a Trevor Zegers level dangler, but just the way he's able to be deceptive and to shift his weight around is really impressive. Um, you know, give him too much time and space. He's kind of like a, like a Bedard in the sense that he's got his heads up and he's reading the play really, really well. Just always having two or three or possibly four options in mind for what he's going to do. You know, he knows when he needs to make the safe play, but he's also able to find the high end plays as well. I don't know if there's a better player in this draft class at hanging onto the puck for just the right amount of time for the right play to open up. You know, he's so patient. He's got so much poise and just the way he's able to dissect opposing defenders with his passing is possibly the best in this entire draft class. So trying to see how that's trying to project how that's going to work at higher levels when he's not the biggest guy and not the fastest guy and not the strongest guy, I think is a very fascinating um, kind of situation for scouts to be in right now. 
Yeah, I just pulled up a uh, highlight reel of his right now. R- seems to have a really nice mohawk, like 10 and 2 skating ability about him as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a few times where, like, he's similar to some of the other top players. Like, he just, like, taps a puck, and it's through your triangle, and you're like, ugh, right by you. Uh, yeah. So I'm guessing like, that's going to be a big piece of his game It's just the ability to kind of be, like, sneaky with his skating and real shifty. Yeah, he's he's elusive for a guy that you might not expect to be, you know, for a lot of guys with his size and skating profile, you know, even at the WHL level, it's easy enough to neutralize him. You know, you close the gap and you ride him into the boards and, you know, that's all the play route. But he just has this way to shimmy and shift and just kind of slip around guys that you don't always see. But I, I love him mostly when he's got that time and space. You know, he's probably going to be more of a perimeter guy. I don't think he'll, comparing him to Berggren, be a guy who's quite as good at getting on the inside because he doesn't quite have that darting speed. He doesn't quite have those bursts. But as a guy who can create from the outside, it's really impressive. You know, his ability to adjust his speed is really good. You know, when he comes in across the blue line, when he stops up, you're like, oh, you know something's going to happen. Like he'll come in and he'll have the option to try and push a play deep or push a play wide. And then he'll slow himself up. And you just, you just know that there's something else going through his head and you'll hang on to the puck for a couple of seconds. And all of a sudden, you know, that pass is going perfectly to the shrieking defender who just burst to get back door for the tap in. So it's, he's, he's so smart. He's definitely one of the purely smartest players in this draft class. And I I just, I think there's so much to his game. That's very special. Yeah. It looks like he loves to like, just basically neutralize a guy by skating like right at him a little bit and like, okay, we got some one-on-one basketball and letting the hands kind of do the work, but he's, he's good at not going directly at players. Like he's attacking on arcs and using a lot of outside edges, which Outside edges are super critical when you're looking at escaping pressure. Um, and, and a lot of guys maybe not don't have that quite yet, especially in the ozone, but at least having the ability to get access to your outside edge is allows a lot of escapability from cycle games, corners, and many other areas of the ice. Um, so just watching him here, I'm seeing him nonstop outside edge, outside edge which for me is, is a major critical element from a player development side. Um, like check that box already has it. Don't have to worry about it. Cause um, like a lot of the kids that I work with um, AAA below, whatever, or even like virtual stuff where I'm doing prep players and professional players and NCAA players. Like some of them just don't have access to the outside edge. Like they've got great 10 and two skating, but they don't have the escapability that you would want out of a turn or a stop up or a delay game that they can access. And it seems like he has that in spades where like attacking on arcs, taking on angles. So it's always really shifty. Like what's he going to do? Where is he going to go? He's got those linear crossovers that really are effective when you're coming up Mm -hmm. the ice on the rush, where it's not so much blazing and trying to take the corner on a guy or drive wide and beat him to the net. Um, but really shifty in how do I create space going laterally once I do get the blue line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's hard to know exactly where he's going to try to attack next, which is, you know, obviously that makes him hard to defend. Um, I haven't talked to Andrew yet. I'm hoping to get a chance when Kelowna comes through town. I think in a couple months here, uh, I'm in Calgary. Uh, but I, I'm, I want to tell him, like, just watch as much Kirill Caprizo as you can. Because I think that's kind of like the, what you want to emulate. You know, I think some of the things that he does are similar in some ways to Kaprizov, but I think if if that's the way he wants to try and focus his game, if he can watch what Kaprizov does well and try to emulate that, I think we could see a similar type of ceiling out of him. I know that's lofty praise, but I I really do think Crystal's a very special player. And I know I'm not alone uh, in that thought in the scouting community. Man, I want to just shoot him. Hey, you know what, kid? Watch Kaprizov. You'll start making $8 million a year, $9 million, whatever Kaprizov's got. Yeah. Uh, too far. Worth every no. penny, though. Absolutely. That's great stuff. Well, what are some other players that we should be watching? Um, whether it be this class or someone that's been drafted already, obviously I've got some players that I love, like Emil Andre, and I'll keep talking about. But 
um, you know, you're out there pounding the road. You're talking with prospects, um, you know, looking at guys actively day in and day out. Uh, so I'm going to rely on your eye for talent. Uh, I mean, I could talk about guys who've been drafted, guys who are draft eligible. Like, is there anyone that you want to know about that I might have seen? Or is this kind of like, who am I excited about right now? Yeah, who gets you excited where like, you're going to see them in the NHL in the next year to three years, or they're just breaking through now? Um, there's one guy I like to talk about a lot because I think he's maybe a little bit undervalued, um, at least on the independent side of the scouting community. But I could also see him being a guy who NHL teams love and will probably pick higher than a lot of consensus might believe um nate danielson uh out of brandon he's just kind of in the front of my mind right now because i'm going to go see them tomorrow uh him and uh, carson bjarnison the really high-end goalie prospect could also go in the first round uh danielson you know almost like diametrically opposite to, to andrew crystal um taller uh center you know really great straight line skater um he's, he's maybe a little bit old school maybe not the most purely skilled guy but just Really great stride extension. Um, I love his top speed. You know, his ability to get behind defensemen, his ability to beat them wide is really impressive. But I also think he's very underrated as a playmaker and a puck handler. Um, there's just so much to like about him. He's a really well-rounded, complete two-way center that might never eclipse like 60 or 70 points in the NHL. But he's a guy who I could easily see playing a thousand games you know, a guy that you can play head to head against, you know, the top centers and other teams, uh, you know, a guy who can be on your top penalty kill, but also play on your top power play. You know, I think there's a lot of value to guys like that. He might not be the most exciting, but I just find him just incredibly efficient, you know, and sometimes you got to find guys like that for your NHL team. Obviously you want to have the guys like your Caprizovs, you know, the guys who you can trust in the offensive situations when you need a goal or you need a big play, like you can have that. But sometimes you just need a guy you can play 20 minutes a night and he's just going to put in a ton of work and not really have any weaknesses to his game, not make many mistakes. And I also wonder if there is more offensive upside to him because we haven't seen him get to play with Hockey Canada at the big international events yet. He doesn't play with a lot of, tel well, a lot of help in Brandon. But he's a guy who just keeps finding ways to show up on highlight reels. He's well over a point per game this season. He's got a point in almost every game he's played. There's only maybe like five or six that he hasn't registered a point. So I don't know. I think he's just a really exciting, well, maybe not an exciting player, but like I really like him as a prospect because I, because I think he's going to be a fantastic NHLer, even if it's not the type of guy that, you know, he gets voted into the all-star game or anything like that. And there's something to be said about just like reliable players like Patrice Bergeron. I mean, he's a second round pick and then he just jumps to the NHL and is a reliable guy game in and game out. Um, Brandon Saad, for example, like just reliable guys, lunch pail, get her done. Um, you know, it's like, how did those type of players provide value, provide value for their team and get paid millions of dollars and become millionaires over time? Like real simple. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we, you know, we all get excited about the Bedards of the world, but there's just a reason why there's only so many of them. Um, it's extremely difficult and it's a difficult league and sport to do. So I, I love players where they're finding ways to provide value and just steady Eddie, like Sean mm -hmm. Crowley. I know I already gave him some crap, but let's give him some praise here. Like there you go. already, like already a guy you're like, I'll send him over the board pretty much as long as they don't like need a goal in the last minute to go up one, like you're going to send him over the board. You're confident. Like he's going to do the right thing. He's going to be positionally sound constantly on the defensive side of the puck where you always have to go through him. And he's a well-built kid. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He, every time I stand next to him, I'm like, bro, like you, you work out a lot, don't you? He's like, yeah, doing some two days, you know, making sure I'm staying strong. You know, it's my assets. I'm like, yeah, you lean straight into it. I love it. So I, I'm assuming that kid's the same way where you're like, okay, he's constantly finding himself in the right, like positioning from a defensive team reliability where a coach is going to want to throw him over the boards. Mm -hmm. Cause there's players that are, are great, but then they are known for like, yeah, they might cheat just a little bit too much here. And it starts putting doubt in your mind as a coach. Like, yeah, do I really want to send him out there with, you know, one minute and we're up by one goal? Like, I don't know about that. 
you also have to look at matchups too. And just having options for how you're matching up against other teams is huge, especially at the NHL level. And what I like about Danielson as, as a center is, you know, he can play the speed game. Well, he can match up against like a Nate McKinnon type of player where if, you know, if the game is all about speed and skill, he can hold his own and, and defend well, and, you know, even drive the play at the other end. But he's also big enough and strong enough and smart enough that he can handle the physical side of things well, too. Like, if he he needs to match up against, like, a Tage Thompson type of player, like, I could see him doing that and holding his own really well. He's maybe – he's certainly not as great at the transition and speed type of game as a McKinnon or the power game as a Thompson, but he's kind of a hybrid of the two. And I think that's going to provide a lot of value. And I think he's going to be a guy that teams really covet in the draft because – you know, he's, he's the type of guy you can put in any situation and kind of play him any kind of way against any kind of opponent. And that provides a lot of value. Absolutely. Uh, there's plenty of defensemen in the NHL that you would probably never know their names. And then you look at the score sheet and you're like, huh, 20 minutes. Interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Devon Taves have been an example for years. So you're like, who? And then you're like, oh, well, he's just a silent killer. Shift in, shift out, slowly, progressively pushing things in the right direction. Um, and against love- any kind of opponent, any kind of system, you know, he's just – he's always able to do it. Yeah. It's, yeah, those players are absolutely critical and valuable. <laughs> um, we, we've drowned on quite a bit here about prospect talk and the details. Is there anything else you want to bring up? Otherwise, uh, give us a two-minute plug. Talk about anything you want, maybe a book that sh- uh, we all should read. And uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll call it a night here. It's, it's getting late for both of us. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Derek underscore N underscore NHL, uh, mostly draft stuff, uh, but also a little bit of Dallas Stars. I covered them for a long time with Defending Big D. That's the team I grew up cheering for, but now most of my focus is on the draft. And I should mention that the team at McKean's Hockey, we are actually updating our draft rankings right now. So sometime in the next week or two, hopefully, we're going to have a new list that we can share. Uh, so, you know, please, uh, give that, a, give that a sight, uh, come and take a look at, you know, how we've got it set up. We've got a great team of scouts from, you know, in Quebec in Europe, in the United States, uh, me and a couple other guys in Western Canada and a great, great video scouting team as well. So I'm really happy with the team we have. And I think we're going to have, you know, one of the best draft lists out there once we get it out in a, in a short order here. Well, you, you know, Will Scouch and I are like best buddies. So, uh, you know, got, got to rock the McKean's love there as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, D- Derek Derek, and Will and Sam and the whole bunch uh, always got good takes as long as they're not uh, knocking me for my Emil Andre love <laughs> and maybe my my hesitancy to say that Cole Perfetti is truly elite elite. Mm-hmm. He's good. Scandalous. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but, I mean, I'm, I'm on the opposite side of that. I'm like, he's good. I'm not sure he's that good, but we'll, we'll find out. We'll save that one for another podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. That concludes this week's episode. Thanks for joining us here at Hockey IQ. If you haven't already, take a quick moment to hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and drop a review. If you want to be a great teammate, even recommend us to a friend. You can follow us at Hockey's Arsenal on Twitter and Instagram. Check out the website, hockeysarsenal.com, where you can subscribe to the weekly newsletter. You won't regret it. Catch you, Buttes, here next week for a brand new episode.